Okay, it's my turn to work now. Let me start by saying that uh, I am deeply humbled and moved to have been chosen the 2019 Templeton Prize Laureate. To be in the company of such wonderful individuals who have devoted their lives to improve the human condition and our mutual understanding is to me an immeasurable honor. I want to express my deep gratitude to the Templeton family and to the John Templeton Foundation for their trust in my work and ideas over the years. This is an evening to celebrate the memory and vision of Sir John Templeton, who understood so well that spirituality is an essential measure of human progress, that we do not measure progress only through material accomplishment, but we have to look at the hearts of people to really understand who we are. I want to thank Heather Templeton Dill from the bottom of my heart for her support and for setting a very unique example of how to combine leadership and humility, something the world badly needs these days. Over the years, the John Templeton Foundation has become an essential source of support and inspiration to countless members of academia and intellectual visionaries, individuals who are pushing the boundaries of human knowledge and understanding, and for that, and I know I'm speaking for many of my colleagues, we are very, very grateful. I thank Joanna Almond, Lynn Coletta, Don Lair, and Ben Carlson, and the whole Templeton Prize team from, because they really are absolutely spectacularly efficient people. And this night would have been impossible without their work. I thank Adam Frank, my dear friend and colleague, for having nominated me and all my Dartmouth colleagues, some of them who made all the way down from Hanover to here, current and past graduate students who are also here and who made the trip for this evening. And it's still finals time, so kudos to you. Marilyn, thank you so much for your kind words. I was so honored and thrilled that you made it and that you accepted to, to, uh, to come to this evening. Phil, thank you for your wonderful words. I'm very proud to be part of the Dartmouth family for almost 30 years now. I'm getting old. Um, but it's been a wonderful experience all along, and I couldn't be happier to be working there. And Secretary Lobo, thank you for your kind words. I'm very, very proud to be honoring our country in this way, in such an unexpected fashion, so to speak. Finally, I want to thank my family members and dear friends who have traveled from as far as Rio and Paris, oh, and Chicago and Los Angeles and Cape Cod to be here tonight. And all of you that could not have made it in person but are here in spirit. I thank my brothers, Luis and Rogerio, for their love of, of all through these years, for their our togetherness has been unfailing. I thank my cousins, one of them made a trip to here, who happens to be a top-notch Spinozan philosopher, and I'm very happy that you made it, Marcus, here. And of course, my many friends who are here tonight, some of them from grade school in Rio, who live in New York now, and also those that couldn't be. I thank my wonderful wife and companion, Carrie, who has, with her bright inner light, illuminated my path forward over the years, showing me that happiness, as opposed to a lot of physics, is not an abstraction. <laughs> and last but not least, I thank my five amazing children sitting here on the front row, Andrew, Eric, Tali, Lucien, and Gabriel, all here tonight for always keeping me on my toes, for inspiring me, for their unconditional love, and for keeping me open to the new and the unexpected. They're always surprising you. Okay, now we begin. I want to talk tonight a little bit about our human disquietude. We are very peculiar creatures because we have this urge to know, and yet we're also limited in our knowledge. There was a French philosopher from the late uh, 1600s called Bernard Le Bouvier de Fontenelle, and in 1686, he published a book, which, by the way, is the same year that Isaac Newton published his book on gravity that Marilyn mentioned. Uh, so Bernard Le, Le Beauvais de Fontenelle wrote a book about a conversation on a plurality of worlds, meaning other planets out there and the possibility of life 
in other places in 1686. Now, this book was very interesting because it had two characters only. It was a conversation between a philosopher and a marquis, so a noble woman who uh, was a very, very rare, if not non-existent thing, to put a woman as a protagonist in a book at that time. And furthermore, she was smarter than the philosopher was, who was the author of the book, and she would always ask, ask him very difficult questions. So one of the questions that she asked was, um, why do you do what you do? You know, what is philosophy? And, and he says, well, you can summarize philosophy in two ways. It's just a sum of two things. Philosophy is about curiosity and short-sightedness. And I think that's just beautiful because it sort of encapsulates the whole idea that we as humans, we want to always know more and know more about ourselves, about our lives, about nature, about the world, and yet we can't. I mean, we progress, we move forward as we develop knowledge, but there is always a limit, a limitation of what we can see. That's the short-sightedness. And so what we do is something quite wonderful. We create instruments, I call them reality amplifiers, that will allow us to see farther into reaches of reality which are hidden to us if we only use the five senses. Because if there is something quite amazing about what's going on right now here, it's not just the ceremony, which is this wonderful celebration, but there are trillions of neutrinos coming all the way from the heart of the sun, going through your bodies per second. And we have no idea this is happening. And you would never have known about neutrinos, about the heart of the sun, and how it shines, and how it creates all the energy that makes life in this planet possible if we had not developed scientific ways of thinking about the world, amplifiers, machines, instruments that allow us to see farther out. And we do this in a creative way, and we have done this for centuries. And in fact, you know, you can even tell this history of astronomy and the history of science in general as a history of scientific instruments. And it is kind of an uncanny coincidence that today, the 29th of May, is the 100th anniversary of the confirmation of Einstein's theory of relativity. And guess where it was confirmed? In Brazil. So 100 years ago, two teams of astronomers from England uh, uh, with, uh, with Arthur Eddington, who was an eminent astrophysicist at the time. One went to the, um, the western coast of Africa, to the Ivory Coast. The other one, the other team went to uh, Brazil, to the city of Sobral, which is in the state of Ceará. Hundred years ago, to the day, there was a solar eclipse, and what Einstein said was something that was going to make us rethink what Newton said about things attract one another, because there is some invisible action at a distance. It was a very magical, weird thing to imagine that it is possible for two bodies that have a mass to attract one another and, and instantaneously. So the sun attracts the earth. How does that happen? Newton was very smart when people said, what is going on? How could the sun and the earth attract one another in this way? He would say, I feign no hypothesis. I don't know, but I can describe this interaction with my theory. So, long time after, Einstein came up and says, let's rethink Newton. And he said that actually gravity is the curvature of space. So if you have a mass, space around that mass is gonna be curved. Now, how can you possibly prove such a crazy idea, right? So one way you can do it is, well, if you have a star that is very, very far away and its light is traveling towards us, and if it goes through the sun on its way, the sun is pretty massive, and hence, according to Einstein, the star would have its light path bent because of the gravity of the sun. And he calculated his theory exactly how much of a deflection is a really tiny, tiny deflection, much smaller than one degree. But astronomy, because of the instruments that have been created at the time, actually, they could measure that because there was enough precision. So the two teams went, one went to, the one that went to Africa, they got bad weather. In Brazil, the weather is not great, but it was good enough to, on this day, look at it. Because you see, the problem is, 
when you're looking at a star, it has to be nighttime. So that doesn't work because the sun is not here. So what do you do? Well, when there is an eclipse, what's going to happen? The moon is going to go right in front of the sun. It's going to block the sunlight, and you have night during the day. And I actually led two Dartmouth Club, uh, Dartmouth alumni cruises to see eclipses with carry, and it's an absolutely spectacular, visceral experience, something that really connects you with a, with a part of, of, of nature that we really don't know until you actually sense it. It's not something you can explain with words. It's something you have to feel, you know, and that's something very important. Sometimes it's not just about the rational explanation of things, but it's really how you relate emotionally to things, and eclipses are very much like that. But for the astronomers on that day, they were on a mission. They really didn't care about the visceral connection with the nature, or with the natural world, so they actually measured the thing during the, the solar eclipse. Now, this is really, really amazing that this happened exactly 100 years ago, because Einstein, as Phil Handel mentioned, you know, was one that said something about the mysterious, right? And in that quote, he says something that the mysterious is the fundamental emotion that is at the cradle of all creativity in the arts and the sciences. So this speaks to our human disquietude again. You know, the notion that we humans have this urge to understand who we are, where we came from, where are we going, is this going to happen forever? Are we going to be in this planet forever? Is the sun going to shine forever? You know, what is the history that led from the beginning of the universe to where we are right now? So I'm really proud to have spent more than 30 years now working on these things, thinking about these things, to learn many, many things about the universe, but also to learn many, many things about humans. And one of the things that I really learned during this experience is that science teaches us humility. You may find that kind of surprising because you do find a lot of arrogant people in academia, right? And, and it reminds me of something my grandfather used to say. You know, he used to say that arrogant people are those people that wear hats which are bigger than their hats, so their eyes are covered. And, and I think that's beautiful because it is a form of not seeing. And one of the things we do see when we pursue science is that we really don't know very much. We have learned a lot, and we are learning a lot very quickly in many different fields. But the metaphor that I created in this book called The Island of Knowledge, I think speaks to the heart of how this works because so the idea is simple, is that if you imagine that everything that we know about the world fits in an island, right? And this island is growing as we learn more and more about the universe, about who we are, etc. But as every good island, this one is surrounded by a notion of the unknown. unknown. So the paradox of knowledge is that as you learn more, the boundaries between what you know and what you don't know, they're always growing. Which means that as you learn more, you're able to ask questions that you couldn't have even conceived of before. Just think of, like now we are talking about the digital era and information and data mining. 50 years ago, this didn't exist. Why did this happen? Because we developed knowledge to do that, that allow us to expand the boundaries of more knowledge. And that is, to me, an endless pursuit. And those people that believe that there is an end to science, there is an end to the way we can think about the world, and we are going to go there and conquer, like if it were some kind of war, that there is a winner in the end, and it's us and reason, I think are deeply mistaken. Because one of the things that we learn in the process is that we don't know enough and we'll never know enough. And that is actually wonderful, because it is the not knowing that allows us to want to know more. It is wanting to know that makes us matter as people. So in the search, in this quest for knowledge, we find meaning. We understand better why we're here. And why we're here, we're here to understand better who we are in this process called the pursuit of knowledge. And another thing that I have learned in these years, and this is really coming from modern science, really last 15 years, where we have been able to look at planets indirectly going around other stars, not just our sun, but other stars far, far away. 
And the more we learn about the universe, the more we learn about these other worlds, the more we realize what a special planet the Earth is. Okay? It's not just because it has water and it's in what we call you know, the habitable zone where water can be liquid. Other planets will do that too. There can be other planets out there. If you think of our, our galaxy alone, there are about a trillion or more worlds. And so clearly, just statistically, you know, some of them may look like the Earth, but Earth is special. Earth is special because it has all these special properties that allow for life to appear here about 3.5 billion years ago and to evolve in fits and starts in complicated ways, in ways that could not have been predicted, in ways that if they had been changed, the course of life in this planet would have been different and we wouldn't be here. So there is a contingency to the human condition, which has to do with the way our planet evolved over three billion years. And that, you know, is something quite beautiful because it responds, it answers this thing about what we call the Copernican angst. You know, the notion I think Heather mentioned before, that the more we know about the universe, this is what people think scientists are saying, the more we know about the universe, the less important we become. Right? We were at the center of everything, then we were pushed aside, and then we're just in a planet, and then the sun is not the center, and then we have a galaxy, but then there are hundreds of billions of other galaxies. There's one indignation after another. You know, we keep pushing out, and what is the point of all this? And so we're discovering all these things to realize we don't matter. Well, that is exactly wrong, because it's exactly when we look at the other worlds, when we look at how rare our planet is, how rare life is, because you go to Mars and you go to Venus and you go to Jupiter, you're not going to find anything. You certainly, if Mars had life, it didn't build radio telescopes or compose Mahler's Fifth Symphony, right? I mean, for sure. So there is something very special about this planet, and there is something very special about us, humans, in this planet, because we are the creatures that are able to understand or try to understand our origins. We are self-aware molecular machines capable of wonder and of awe. And that, to me, is something that should be celebrated every day. And more than that, given the times that we're living on right now, where the Earth is being stressed by overpopulation and pollution and tornadoes in New York, this is really crazy, tornadoes in New York, this is a moment for us to reflect on who we are, not as a tribe here against a tribe there, but as a species, a one species unified in a planet, and we need to be together now more than ever and to celebrate and respect life and respect one another, and respect is not enough. You need to be open to learn from other people that think differently from what we, the way we think, because only there, only then we'll be able to understand one another better, go beyond the tribal divides that have been a real problem in the modern world. They were very useful 10,000 years ago. They're not very useful anymore. We need to unite as a species so that we have a future, that we have to be proud to leave the world to the future generations a better place than we found. And that, to me, is the moral imperative of our time. And that is what I want to dedicate my next few years and the honor of having the Templeton Prize for, to create a sense of moral imperatives where we humans are together trying to save this planet and life with everything that we've got. Thank you.